Welcome back, fellow travelers. I didn't think I'd be on YouTube in February, but I found some fun mind benders that I wanted to share, and I think I'll have to split it into two videos. I hope you make it to the grand finale of this one, because, well, I'll admit it's totally nuts, but it's so unreal that I thought it would be fun to blow your mind. I've been saying since I posted my first sort of teaching video on this channel that I'm a dot connector. I can't help it. My mind looks at events, dates, people, names, star signs, and things, and starts connecting dots. Most of it is just fluff and stuff, but sometimes I think it might be important. In this video, I'm going to show direct connections between the birth and death of Jesus and the signs in the heavens that we've been witnessing over the past seven years. I'll show the facts and connect some dots that I believe are way beyond coincidence. Oh, before we get started, I want to thank the person who donated to my channel a few days ago and someone else who bought me some coffees not long ago. Thanks to you, I've got internet this month, and I've got some hot coffee to help me through all this. Thank you so much. And thank you to the others who have helped me along the way over the years. I really appreciate you, and we will all meet up in the kingdom soon. Also, a few people requested that I leave my last videos posted and simply shut off the comment sections while I was off the internet. A great idea. I've also got a very basic timeline posted on my community wall if you want it. It marks the dates of the main signs in the heavens that I've been showing and gives the day counts between events. My timeline isn't totally based on the 777 of the Jericho Key, but it's a great starting point. I could probably make a timeline 2 feet tall and 10 feet long, but there's no point to it all. We all know time is running short here. And just one more quick thing. I ran across a fun channel from Eric Reichman, who also does a lot of really cool studies in Stellarium and I enjoyed his series on the Seven Seals. This is what his channel looks like. I haven't seen every single one of his videos yet, but the events he talks about for the Seals were some major signs in the heavens, and lined right up with things on my own timeline. And then he talks about current events too, and shares his insights. He does a great job at teaching, so if you like these kind of videos, check him out. Of course, like I always say when I mention other channels, I never run across someone that sees every single thing the way I do, and I'm totally okay with that. It's the same for every one of us. We aren't looking for someone to agree with on everything. That would be pointless. It's about exploring others' ideas and insights, and sometimes we find whole new ways of looking at or thinking about things. As you know, I love watching and studying God's clock in the heavens. Like our clocks, too, it is very stable and rhythmical. So major signs like eclipses and blood moons tend to roll out in patterns. But there are also so many little moving parts on God's clock, like the orbits of the planets all going at their own various paces. And combined with the precession cycle and Earth's wobble, there are sometimes incredible events that occur that just can't be overlooked, like the Revelation 12 sign of 2017. And these great solar eclipses that are drawing out particular marks, like the very finger of God, over the entire United States, and even starting and intersecting at key points. It's rare for something like this to happen on a continent, from sea to shining sea. October 7th was the great eighth day of tabernacles, when the war in Israel started. 
and with the wedding ring eclipse from October 14th, I can't get my mind off of John's Gospel, chapter 8, which was right after the story of the great eighth day of tabernacles, perhaps even the following Sabbath, because John states that Jesus went into the temple to teach. This is when Jesus stooped down twice and wrote on the ground. After the woman had been caught in adultery, a key scene to keep in mind. In a way, this scene always reminds me of a marriage proposal with Jesus stooped down on bended knee and telling the woman that he does not condemn her and that she should go and sin no more. And that even reminds me of the wedding ring eclipse right on the finger of Virgo. John chapter 8 immediately following the Feast of Tabernacles. Such fantastic chapters. I need to hurry up and finish this video so I can go study them all over again. So, back to our signs in the heavens. When looking at God's clock, our whole backdrop of stars across the heavens is ever-flowing, like a slow, lazy river across the heavens. Nothing about God's clock and story in the heavens really ever repeating. And as each age slowly ticks by, our entire backdrop of stars will shift by about 30 degrees or one hour on God's clock. To get through all 12 ages, it takes nearly 26,000 years. And luckily, we have free programs like Stellarium, so we can really unroll God's scroll in the heavens, past, present, and future, and dive in to the entirety of his story, as above, so below. The ages on God's clock do have starting and ending points, and often signaled by both signs in the heavens and major events on earth. I guess you could say that Jesus marked the final end to the age of Aries the Ram, and the age of Pisces and the fishers of men had truly begun. But the age of Pisces is now at an end on God's clock, and the age of Aquarius must begin. We aren't going to turn back the hands on God's clock in the heavens any more than you can bring back yesterday. The first sign that I wanted to talk about is more on the sign of Jonah, and then the others are just super quick and almost self-explanatory. I'll start with this verse from Revelation, which was actually the springboard for both of the videos I want to make. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 And I beheld, and lo, that means a double pay attention. In the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So this statement about, I beheld a lamb as it had been slain, has always really stuck in my mind, and I've pondered over it a lot, because I know that John is giving us a major clue here. And like I said, Jesus was a definitive end to the age of Aries the Ram, or Lamb. And it's not something John literally saw. I mean, he's not beholding a dead and bloody farm animal in heaven before the throne of God. Nor would Jesus ever appear in heaven as he was on the cross. John is telling us something more. Do you see what I'm saying? If he wanted to simply tell us that he saw Jesus standing in the midst, he would have described him in the glorious, wondrous ways 
that he did in all the other places in Revelation. This is something more that John is telling us, and John is often very cryptic about some of his secrets, just like in the final chapter of his Gospel. And John is one of very few writers we have who attended the crucifixion. I've shown this stellarium shot before and talked about it, but I'm going to revisit this in depth. This is the horizon line from east to west over Jerusalem at the moment of sundown beginning Passover of 30 AD. The red cardinal points across the screen, if you can see them, is the horizon line. As I mentioned before, the most obvious thing here is that we see a clear reference to the Revelation 12 sign with the completely full moon rising exactly at Virgo's feet in the east as the sun, the light of the world, is going down in the west and darkness falls over Jerusalem and the tomb of Christ is closed and sealed. I feel that John is telling us to really have a closer look at this scene in the heavens. After all, that's where he was in heaven, weeping and beholding the Lamb as it had been slain. Stellarium is a very accurate program, and this is the start of Passover of 30 AD. I've been through other years on Stellarium, and all the things I'll be showing here aren't going to line up like this. Perhaps someone out there has done a better video like this one on another year. I haven't seen it. This makes me think that, in a way, the Revelation 12 sign of 2017 was meant as a glaring reminder of the crucifixion. That was 33 days after the first Great American Eclipse, which also has a big connection to all this. The Revelation 12 sign occurred on the third day after Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the day of shouting. And in 2017, the crown of 12 stars, people say, were formed by three planets and the stars of Leo, which is similar to the sign at Jesus' birth, which I'll go over in a bit. For me, I don't think the crown of 12 stars formed by three planets is always critical when it's just referencing the event, because I think when it comes right down to it, the crown of 12 stars of the woman is symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. So if you get what I'm saying, the crown is there whether the stars are there or not, like Virgo during the crucifixion. Perhaps the reason God lined up the 2017 sign the way he did was so that we would all know that it was no ordinary event and really pay attention to it for years and stick it on all our timelines. Since the Revelation 12 sign of 2017 occurred right at sunset, same as Crucifixion Day, I always count it as September 24th of 2017 as the Jews count days. So when I really started thinking about this Passover scene in 30 AD, I also see what I've been calling the sign of Jonah. I mean, I've got videos posted about what I'm already calling the sign of Jonah. And now I'm seeing that the sign of Jonah that I've been going on about, it was the exact sign in the heavens during when Jesus was in the grave for three days. It's where the sun was in the heavens during the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. Let me show you the three days that Jesus was in the tomb so you can see the distance that the sun traveled in the heavens between the feet of Ares the Lamb. Behold, a lamb as it had been slain. 
April 6th of 30 AD at sundown and Jesus goes into the tomb. These are the next four days, the 7th, 8th, and 9th, and the fourth day would be the 10th. The days that the sun was passing beneath the feet of Ares the Lamb. If he was in the tomb for three days and three nights, as he described the sign of Jonah, then he would have risen really early on the 10th and met up with the apostles that evening. Some say he was only in the tomb two days and rose before dawn on the third day, but I'm not sure. If those two days were both Sabbath days, like a Friday Passover and a Saturday, I'm not sure when the women would have shopped and prepared the stuff that they did. But either way, it's not a big difference here with the sun's position. This sign of Jonah so perfectly lines up with where that blood moon occurred on November 8th of 2022. It's basically the same distance that the moon traversed during the blood moon on November 8th. It was the longest blood moon in 33 years, and exactly 333 days later, Israel was attacked. And the 33 and the 333 are Jesus' numbers. So I'm feeling like the sign of Jonah that I've been pointing out really was a significant sign. It's the sign in the heavens during the days that Jesus was in the tomb. Only during the burial, it was the sun traveling beneath the feet of Ares. And during the blood moon, it's of course the moon traveling across that space. And I feel that John left us the breadcrumbs to follow in Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. This blood moon back on November 8th of 2022 was not the only ominous sign in the heavens that night either. For those who were with me back then, there was another rare alignment happening during that blood moon night. As you can see, the sun and Mercury, his messenger, were in exact conjunction that night at the tip of Libra the scales or the cross. I sort of see them as witnesses because the bride Venus was hanging squarely on the cross that night during the blood moon, perhaps being weighed in the balance. I mean, just think about it. During the blood moon sign of Jesus in the tomb, while Venus the bride is hanging on the cross in the judgment scales. I remember what an ominous feeling I had about it all as this date was approaching, and I sort of thought we could have been raptured about two weeks before this event, and I was saying that it was not a good sign for Israel for the bride to be hanging on the cross like that during that particular blood moon with the two witnesses right there with her. And perhaps I was right, exactly 333 days later to the hour, Israel was attacked, and it was all-out war. In some spooky way, it reminds me of what Jesus had to say to John as he hung on that cross. Behold thy mother. Those statements that Jesus made to both of them always haunt me because I feel in some way he was saying it to all of Israel. Whatever your beliefs, what I want to show you are the facts that Stellarium is showing. This was, I believe, Resurrection Day of 30 AD, and this was the Blood Moon Lunar Eclipse on November 8th of 2022, exactly 42 months to the day 
of when Israel celebrated their 71st birthday. And then, exactly 333 days after this blood moon, Israel was attacked. This slide is from my previous videos. The top half is something I posted back in 2022 when I was talking about where the blood moon would be happening on November 8th. As you can see, on the day that Israel celebrated turning 71, the sun was again in this position, at the hind foot of Aries. The same as on the day Jesus Christ had risen and returned to his apostles. Exactly 42 months to the day after their birthday celebration was the longest blood moon in 33 years that happened in that same spot that the sun traversed during the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. Then, exactly 333 days later, Israel was attacked and the battles began. And if you saw my last few videos, when I was talking about the need to spend 40 days with Jesus in the upper room, or your quiet space, beginning at the sign of Jonah, that I was also seeing in the wee hours of January 19th, it all just makes perfect sense to me. January 19th was the same sign in the heavens on the very night that Jesus returned from the grave and met with his apostles in the upper room. That just totally blows my mind. January 19th and the same sign in the heavens that marked the very start of the 40 days that Jesus spent with his apostles. And what I've been calling the sign of Jonah's 40-day warning cry. Those 40 days gets us to leap day, when the moon exactly rises once again at the foot of Virgo. You just can't make this stuff up. Look, at exactly moonrise over Jerusalem on Passover 30 AD and Leap Day of 2024, exactly 40 days after I see the warning signal of Jonah, and then 40 days after Leap Day is the Great American Eclipse. And those days leading up to the eclipse from Leap Day on my timeline are the days of Noah, which I'm afraid could be big trouble. And I'm just getting started with all this. If your mind isn't already feeling twirly, then just wait. And if you haven't seen the last four videos on my channel, you might want to watch them. So, I think my January 19th date is a match for the sign in the heavens for the very night that Jesus first met the apostles in the upper room. Not a match as in dates, but a match as in signs on God's clock. And it just totally blows me away that I was warning everyone to get into their upper rooms and spend some time with Jesus starting at sundown on January 18th. And I hadn't even realized all this stuff yet. I told about this before when it first happened, but I woke up from a crazy dream on October 7th, dreaming about the number 7,000, having no idea what it all meant. It made no sense in my dream, but it felt like the finger of God had touched my mind, which woke me up. I immediately got on the internet and started seeing the news reports that weren't even an hour old saying that Israel had been attacked. So I searched it all out in the Bible and it was about Revelation chapter 11 and the 7,000. What John is referencing in Revelation chapter 11 verse 13 are the remnant of the 7,000 that God had saved in Israel 
while Elisha spent his 40 days on the mountain with God. The tenth of the city that John says will fall is the remnant that God saved in Jerusalem from Isaiah chapter 6. But that whole biblical study is perhaps for another time. Pause it and take notes if you need to and read about it. Read Isaiah chapter 5 too. It goes right along with Revelation and the harvest. If you ask me, the second woe is nearly past, and the third woe comes quickly, and that's when the seventh trumpet sounds, and it's judgment day and wrath. I hope everyone is prepared and spending as much time as they can in the Word and doing studies and just hanging out with God every moment. So let's get through this. Hopefully this is the easy stuff. I guess the next thing I noticed was that on Passover of 30 AD, our king planet Jupiter is sitting right on the cord of Pisces. And that's right where this upcoming eclipse is going to happen. Here's the side-by-side -side shots of the two events, 2,000 years apart. And on the day that I think Jesus was crucified. Is this our signal of the start and then the end of the church age? What are the odds of this happening? Especially after what I've been showing you. The king planet on that cord to start the church age. And the sun and the moon together on that cord to bring an end to the church age. These are the two great American eclipses. The one from 2017 occurred right next to Regulus the king star in the heart of Leo. So I looked again at Passover of 30 AD, and there it is, Uranus, sitting right at the king star of Regulus, and it is there during the three days that Jesus was in the tomb. I wanted to double check and investigate Uranus more, and in Greek, it is Uranus. It appears 284 times in the New Testament and is the word mostly translated as heaven. It is Strong's word G3772 if you want to look it up. I couldn't believe it. So during the three days that Jesus spent in the tomb, the planet heaven was sitting in in the heart of Leo at the King Star. So the odds of all this happening is getting to be a bit much. On Passover of 30 AD, we have both the King Planet and the Planet Heaven marking the locations of both of the Great American Eclipses. Total solar eclipses drawing the Aleph and the Tav and Alpha and Omega across the whole of the United States. Plus, we have the whole sign of Jonah playing out over the years, with Israel celebrating turning 71, the Psalm 9010 prophecy of Israel's 70 years. And exactly 42 months to the day later, we have the Jonah sign blood moon that is the exact mirror of the three days Jesus was in the tomb. Then, exactly 333 days later, war in Israel. Then, 80 days before the final eclipse, and we have the Jonah signal again mirroring the day that Jesus returned to his apostles for 40 days. And at the end of those 40 days, which is 40 days before the final eclipse, we see the moon at Virgo's feet exactly at moonrise, mirroring the exact time that they put Jesus into the tomb. 
and I'm seeing that date as a bad omen. Forty days before this final eclipse, leap day, and I'm ready to take a flying leap off this planet. People, the odds of all these signs happening are astronomical. But wait, it's about to blow your minds. Let's go back to sundown, starting Passover, and look again. And I hope you know your scriptures. Do you see where the sun's messenger or angel is, Mercury? Sitting right next to the seven stars of the Pleiades at the crucifixion. With the seven stars in his right hand. But this is even crazier. Watch, and I'll click through a few days. Mercury stands still, and even goes retrograde at that point, and starts heading back to meet up with the sun. I've put the red target on Mercury, because when it goes retrograde, they make it a tiny dot in Stellarium. This is the 14th, which would be eight days after the crucifixion, and this is the 21st, and the Sun and Mercury are now together, and the new moon is right there with them. This is two weeks after the crucifixion. The whole idea that at the crucifixion, Mercury, the messenger, is right there, right next to the seven stars, is just too much. And then stopping and immediately going retrograde to meet up with the sun. Well, check this out. After seeing all this, I decided to take another look at the date that so many say that Jesus was born. On 9-11, September 11th, such a famous date for Americans, and in 3 BC. Well, you have to set Stellarium to 2 BC because they count the year zero. So this is the day. And I'm sure you can see the immediate similarity to the Revelation 12 sign. We've got three planets across Virgo and Leo. And there is the new moon below the feet of Virgo at sundown. And this was also Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the day of shouting, and the new civil year for the Jews. I've totally lost count at this point how many Revelation 12 signs with the moon at Virgo's feet we see on our key dates. But this is what really got me when it comes to this being the correct date of Jesus' birth. It's hard to see the names because this is such a close conjunction, but we've got the king planet Jupiter at the king star Regulus in the heart of Leo, the lion of Judah. It's unreal. And again, it's the same place as planet heaven was when Jesus was in the tomb, and the same place as the great American eclipse number one, when the sun and the moon came together at the king star. So, what are the odds of that when at the famous Revelation 12 sign of 2017, we had the king planet Jupiter bouncing around in the belly of Virgo for nine months before the sign occurred? And on the very day that Jesus was born, Jupiter, our king planet, was at the king star in the heart of the Lion of Judah on Yom Teruah, or Rosh Hashanah, the day of shouting. Oh, are you ready for the grand finale? I haven't forgotten about the wedding ring eclipse that happened right after Israel was attacked on their great eighth day of tabernacles. That wedding ring eclipse right on Virgo's ring finger as a reminder of God's covenant when the sun and the moon came together on Virgo's finger, 
and on the very next Sabbath, too, one week exactly after the attack. When I say John was given the reed during the wedding ring eclipse to measure the worshippers in the temple. Because Reedsport, Oregon was the first place that this eclipse touched the U.S. at the center line. I think this is a better great eighth day from Luke chapter 2 verse 22. According to Levitical law, a woman is impure for seven days after giving birth to a male child, one week, and the child is presented at the temple on the eighth day for circumcision. Luke writes that Jesus was taken to the temple in Jerusalem. The day that Jesus shed first blood in the temple on his eighth day as a sign of his covenant with God, the true great eighth day. If Jesus was born on 9-11, then his eighth day would have been September 18th, 9-18. I'm going to change positions here on Stellarium and set my clock to the morning of 9-18, just so Virgo is more upright. And Mary and Joseph probably did show up at the temple in the morning. It doesn't matter too much because the sun is still going to be in this spot in the early afternoon. And since it is 9.18, then I might as well just set the time for 9.18 in the morning. 9.18 on 9.18 sounds perfect. So, this was the sign in the heavens when Jesus was first presented at the temple in Jerusalem, and the priests shed first blood at his circumcision. This is the wedding ring eclipse on Virgo's ring finger at 9.18 a.m. on October 14th of 2023. And if you think I'm kidding around, you can look it all up yourself, but this is a screenshot from the time and date website of the exact moment of maximum eclipse over Reedsport, Oregon, when I think John was given the read at exactly 9.18 a.m on the morning of the eighth day after Israel was attacked. I mean, how is this even possible? The exact minute that this wedding ring eclipse touched the U.S. points us to the very date that Jesus first entered the temple in Jerusalem and made his Abrahamic covenant with God by circumcision and shedding his blood. I'll try to have another continuation video out soon. Peace out, my friends.